most Americans lived without electricity. When night fell, only candles and lamps held off the darkness. America was electrified in the 20s. Electric lights extended the day, opened up new possibilities for work and play. That surge of new power came first to the cities. And by the decade's end, the majority of American homes had electricity. You can't understand this century without understanding the effect, the impact of science and technology. My father's generation is the one that really saw amazing changes. He was born in 1900 in a world where the horse was still the main means of getting about. The car seemed to me uh, more revolutionary in a way than anything that's happened since. It totally changed the kind of space we live in, really. The car would give Americans a sense of autonomy and freedom. The freedom to escape their city or town, to go away on a vacation or simply on a day's outing. By mid-decade, the government was spending more than one billion dollars on the construction of highways, bridges, and tunnels. The beginnings of a national infrastructure which knit the country together. My father took my mother and me in the car for the first ride through the Holland Tunnel. This was opening night. All the cars were lined up to go through the tunnel. I was petrified. I cringed. Suppose the water leaks in. How did they build the tunnel under the water? Where's the water? And I imagined as we were riding through the tunnel that I heard the waves overhead. Out on the so-called highways of those days, outside of New York, we saw the billboards. Roadways were soon dotted with a new phenomenon, roadside advertising. They were big and colorful and beautiful, I thought. Advertising helped transform not just the physical landscape, but the cultural one. Along with advertising came the expansion of a brand new consumer concept. Credit. The old inhibition against debt came tumbling down, as everything from cars to clothes could be bought on time. Buy now, pay later became the order of the day. By 1927, 75% of all household goods were bought on credit. And in the last years of the decade, the item desired most was the radio. From its scratchy beginnings in 1920 as a mere hobby, radio would become a nationwide phenomenon as important as the car. Young radio enthusiast Albert Sindlinger was there at the birth of modern radio. In 1920, the night station KDKA, broadcasting from a factory rooftop in Pittsburgh, transmitted the results of the presidential election. One of the gentlemen was reading the election returns. He got sick, so for about 45, 35 or 45 minutes, I read election returns. Uh, nobody had any comprehension of the significance of what was going on. But don't forget, there were only a couple of hundred listeners. Within six months, every store in America, even grocery stores, were selling radio sets. Suddenly, all Americans were listening to the same things, laughing at the same jokes. It was a kind of communal exercise here, and a very much a strengthening of your notion of what it was to be an American. Along with, and sometimes propelled by the great technological leap in the 1920s, social patterns in place for decades also began to shift. Nowhere was this more obvious than with the changes for American women. 
an expanding job market had given more and more women careers and the disposable income to do with what they wished. Throughout the 1920s, women would assert a newfound freedom and independence, and nothing symbolized it more than the 19th Amendment. In 1920, after 81 years of agitation, women won the right to vote. A woman's lot had changed in almost every way. She thought that she had the right to live for herself rather than for her family, for others, as women were always supposed to. She went to bars. She went to after-hours clubs. She went to wild parties. She had much shorter hair. She wore much more makeup. You go from having young women whose dresses reach to their ankles to flesh, flesh everywhere. And a lot of 20s culture is about the fun of smashing prohibitions. The more daring women of the day were known as flappers and vamps. Sure, I remember flappers. They were all over the place. I mean, they, they were older than me. But, uh, you know, you look at, when you look at the flappers through the eyes of, the, of a young guy, wow! I think a flapper was the type of, of young woman who just wanted to see how far she could go and then would stop because she'd be afraid to go too far. And a vamp didn't care how far she went. The shattering ways of 1920s city life were spread by the media to rural America, places where the changes were not always so easy to get used to. Smoking uh, or drinking, uh, being loose with talk, using profanity, this sifted down from the cities, from New York and Chicago. And uh, this finally had a unwarned place in our little community. Here was a girl who'd come home from, she'd been working in Chicago. She comes home with short dresses on. Well, they were not wearing short dresses. They were going to church with hats on and with white gloves on. They were decidedly concerned about what future generation is going to bring. This country was founded on a respect for God and a sense of righteousness and keeping the Sabbath day and, and people brought their children up under discipline and under the reading of the scripture. And all of those things were part of the things that bound us together in America. The, the people were solid. We had church going and very little crime and so on. As the cities grew in size and influence, many people in small-town America found them threatening, a breeding ground for new and often alien ideas. In one small American town, the forces of traditional religion and modern science would clash in a battle heard round the world. Here in Dayton, Tennessee, in the summer of 1925, one of the century's most famous courtroom battles would take place. John T. Scopes stood accused of teaching Darwin's theory of evolution, that man and ape shared a common ancestor. That was against the law in Tennessee. The Scopes trial attracted the best legal brains of the time. William Jennings Bryan, three times presidential candidate and a Christian fundamentalist himself, came to prosecute. Clarence Darrow, the celebrated Chicago trial lawyer, came to defend Scopes. Outside, as the trial progressed in the scorching summer heat, Dayton had itself a carnival. People 
would bring in trained chimpanzees dressed in suits and ties and they'd lead them up and down the streets. Read your Bible was everywhere in town, posted up on the street, across the street, banners. And you walk maybe a hundred yards this way and you'd have a street preacher. I didn't know what he was preaching about. And you never saw the same people twice. You go to the same place next next day, there'd be some other people from some other part of the United States there. But it was it was a lot of hoopla. I enjoyed it. The Scopes trial became emblematic. Everybody had to make up their mind. People who've never been to Tennessee, couldn't even find Tennessee, had to think about this question. Do I believe in modern science? At times, it seemed that the whole world had converged on Dayton. The aisles were filled and the walls were lined with newspaper people from England, from Spain, from France. We had so many newspaper people there that, that you couldn't stir them with a stick. When all the hoopla ended, John T. Scopes was found guilty and fined a hundred dollars, a ruling later overturned on a technicality. What Scopes represented and what the world came to witness was a colossal clash of ideals. The cool reason of science seemed to threaten the deep and abiding roots of religion. It was one thing to replace the family mule with a Model T, but quite another to trade Matthew, Mark, and John for Einstein, Freud, and Darwin. For many people, these were confusing times. And what may have been the most unsettling about the pace of change in the 1920s was that people really wanted both the benefits of the future and the familiar comforts of the past. They want the fruits of modernity. They want automobiles, electricity, radio. And at the same time, they want it to remain 1850, and they know they cannot have both. And this creates a psychological tension within American society that is then looking for somewhere to go. And it goes into hatred towards immigrants, hatred towards people who, who are simply different. It goes into intolerance and into the Ku Klux Klan. Ku Klux Klan membership soared to four million in the 1920s. Almost everybody that was a good citizen in the South was a member of the Klan. I think they were encouraging morality by turning the light on, on immorality and deceit and unfairness. It created a great deal of, uh, I'd say, consternation and debate and so on. They were not just uh, opposed to the blacks, but they were opposed to the Catholics and the Jews or anybody else who came somewhere. Going to people's houses and calling them out and insulting them and whipping them and things of that kind. This was not just peculiar to the South at Alabama, it was nationwide. The Klan was actively recruiting in many northern states. My father was asked if he would like to join the Ku Klux Klan. He grabbed the guy by the collar and threw him down the stairs. Three nights later, almost directly across the street, there was a large cross burning. I still can see it in my mind. It was a dreadful, horrifying experience. My mother said, it's just as though they're guarding the gates of hell. Those white people who, who catered to us and were in sympathy with us, they caught hell too. James Cameron was living in Indiana when he and two childhood friends were seized by a Klan-inspired mob, enraged by reports of the rape and murder of a white couple. Many of them out in the, out in the crowd had, had their robes and, and hood on too. And then the leader said, take all these niggas out and hang them. His two friends were lynched. 
James Cameron barely escaped.